Hello everyone and welcome to our third mini lecture in our addiction unit. This is uh, neurobiology of addiction. So let's start off by talking a little bit about the reward circuit. So don't freak out. Um, I know there's a lot on this picture, but you're not going to have to memorize all of it. I just want to point out a couple of, of key things. So this is the circuit that's responsible for the reinforcing effects of abused drugs. Remember we talked about uh, the positive reinforcing quality of drugs of abuse in our learning mini lecture, uh, meaning basically just that obtaining a drug will strengthen the preceding behavior. And this is the circuit that is strengthening that preceding behavior. This is a highly conserved circuit, um, evolutionarily speaking, meaning that our model organisms have a lot of the same machinery that we humans do. In particular, the structures we're spending a lot of time talking about, the, the VTA and the nucleus accumbens, are present in rats and mice, just as well as they are in higher order species like uh, non-human primates and humans. And a lot of the other structures that we'll mention here as well are also uh, present or a similar structure is present. So uh, zooming in a little bit more here, I wanna say that different drugs activate different receptors in various parts of the circuit. That's a general statement. Um, but we're going to talk about in, in more detail about these uh, particular mechanisms as we move into the units where we are discussing these particular drugs. Uh, but just for example, uh, cocaine, since it's something we've talked about a couple of times already, causes dopamine release directly. Remember, we talked about how it reverses transporter function and propels a whole bunch of dopamine out to the synapse. So cocaine exerts its reinforcing effect directly by causing more dopamine to be released directly into the nucleus accumbens. Opioid drugs, which we'll talk about in much more detail later on, work both directly indirect and indirectly. So there's um, opioid receptors in uh, a number of different regions, including the nucleus accumbens. Um, but in addition to its effects uh, directly through opioid signaling, it has indirect effects that increase the amount of dopamine signaling as well. Uh, that's kind of a common thread that we see with most reinforcing drugs is that they enhance dopamine release in uh, this pathway. So activation of that mesolimbic dopamine pathway, remember uh, three different dopamine pathways we talked about uh, back in our dopamine unit. The mesolimbic pathway, right, that's from VTA up to our limbic system. Uh, in particular, it's projections to the nucleus accumbens. Activation of that system is absolutely central to reward and reinforcement. And as we talk about all these different drug classes going forward, something we'll probably keep coming back to is how exactly does this drug work mechanistically and in what way is it increasing the amount of dopamine that's released in this reward pathway. And this is often something you see in dumb articles where uh, the authors will say something like, oh, our study, this study shows that sugar is just as addictive as cocaine and it uses the same brain mechanisms. It's the sugar does the same thing to your brain that cocaine does. In a very um, generous interpretation, you could say that's true because reinforce, reinforcement in general recruits this pathway. So anytime you eat food that you like or get money or do something else that you enjoy, you have dopamine release and nucleus accumbens but it's not in the same order and not in the same exact way that drugs of abuse do. So yes, basically true, junk food is reinforcing in the same way that drugs are, but just like not nearly the, the same amount. So let's talk a little bit about incentive sensitization. Uh, as we talked about with that sort of spiral of decline in the, uh, the first mini lecture, uh, repeated progression through the cycle results in decline of rewards. So with repeated use of a drug, with things like tolerance, we see that the drug is just less reinforcing. And then other factors sort of start to step in and drive that level of responding once you're into it. So this might be sort of counterintuitive, right? You see a decrease in liking for a drug, right? It's less reinforcing, but you see an increase in wanting it. So while somebody who's in sort of deep in the cycle of addiction where they're addicted to a given substance, they might get a lot less pleasure out of using that drug than would somebody who is completely naive to the drug taking experience. That said, they want it much more than someone who is relatively new to taking that drug. They have a great wanting for it, but not very much liking. And that might seem kind of strange. How can you want something when you don't really like it? That has to do with the sort of broad idea of incentive salience. And the, the Barrage Lab up at Michigan has done a lot, a lot of great work on this stuff. Um, 
this is the idea that as addiction develops, the user develops increased wanting despite static or decreased liking. So how does that work? Uh, just to sort of keep it brief and superficial, different brain mechanisms uh, moderate liking versus wanting. So these are neurobiologically distinct things. Uh, liking is more linked to activity in these sort of hedonic hotspots or pleasure centers, so places like your nucleus accumbens or medial forebrain bundle, uh, where the wanting system is much more widespread and diffuse and includes also that uh, mesolimbic dopamine pathway. So something that's really cool about all of this incentive learning stuff is it's not just a change in how the organism thinks about the reinforcer, the drug itself, but also the cues that predict it in its environment. So let's say you have a reinforcer, maybe something like drug delivery that is paired with a cue. Maybe a light comes on when the drug is delivered. Initially, that reinforcer is really meaningful and the cue is not so meaningful, it's just a light. But with these two things being paired together enough, the cue actually becomes valuable in itself. The cue is a, a source of attraction because it predicts something good, right? It predicts that drug showing up. So we start to like that cue. Um, that's an incentive process, right? So some incentive learning takes place and that cue actually soaks up some of that value. The cue becomes valuable in itself. So what we see if we sort of remove the reinforcer from the situation entirely and present the cue by itself, what do we think might happen? If you think back to what we covered in our second mini lecture about how a cue that was previously associated with a drug can drive responding, can sort of cause that relapse or reinstatement, this is why the cue presented on its own is now sufficient to motivate behavior. Uh, there's just the presentation of that cue that was previously paired with drug uh, is enough to really drive responding in that uh, direction. Uh, and so that's what it looks like in the lab, but if we translate that out to the real world, we might be able to say something like uh, with relapse, seeing something like a discarded syringe, like a drug that might have been paired previously with drug administration might motivate drug seeking. Because that cue in itself has value, it's able to cause this reinstatement of it. It's going to prompt drug seeking. And there's a lot more I could say about this. A lot of my postdoc work was concerned with this very process. Uh, and there's a lot more to it than this, but this is just sort of a, a very superficial uh, description of incentive learning. And just to sort of continue on with our discussion of learning and how it can lead to uh, relapse. I want to mention very, very briefly the concept of conditioned withdrawal. This is another really, really interesting learning phenomenon. So with repeated drug use, you get the development of physical dependence, which we talked about much earlier on in the course. Uh, so in a dependent state, uh, reduced levels of the drug in the body um, due to a delay in obtaining more of the drug can lead to withdraw symptoms, right? Sort of a negative response to there being no drug in the system. And this is an unconditioned uh, withdrawal response, right? It's an unconditioned stimulus uh, in, in terms of learning. Uh, however, with this sort of withdrawal state being paired repeatedly with cues in the environment, these environmental stimuli that can become associated with that withdrawal response, you can actually get the development of a conditioned withdrawal state. So if, for example, uh, if you're a drug user that's unable to obtain drug and you go into a withdrawal state, and maybe when this happens, you always do it in a similar place. You're uh, in the same house or the same room of a house, sitting on the same you know, uh, couch, listening to the same kind of music, that can become conditioned. You can actually come to associate that withdrawal state with those stimuli that you're always experiencing with the withdrawal state. And then what happens is uh, symptoms can be triggered by those stimuli. So just by being around things that you would surround yourself with in a withdrawal state can cause the conditioned response of withdrawal symptoms, including craving. So not only can exposure to cues that were paired with drug use itself cause relapse or reinstatement, exposure to cues that were associated with your withdrawal state can do something similar. Okay, uh, that's it for this little mini lecture. I'll see you guys next time.